Welcome. Today we are speaking with Kevin Hill, Rochelle Shan, and Scott Buckley of EFPR Group. EFPR Group is an accounting firm of CPAs serving clients across the United States and internationally. EFPR have recently joined the Australian community as a sponsor, and we wanted to give our members an opportunity to meet EFPR's international tax team. Kevin, if I can first ask you to introduce the team and let our viewers know how EFPR became an Australian-friendly tax firm. Thank you, James. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, first of all, my name's Kevin Hill. I'm a partner at EFPR, and I lead out our international tax group. With me today is Rochelle Sharp. She is also a partner in our international tax group, and Scott Buckley, who is a manager in our international tax group. We have a number of other people that work with us, but we figured three of us was more than enough for today. So uh, we're very glad to be here. We've worked with Australians for probably about a decade. We started our international tax practice in 2010, really from just a handful of various and sundry expatriate clients. We shortly, shortly after we started, we met a family that had immigrated from Australia to the US, actually in our town, Rochester, New York, bringing their business uh, to the US, also keeping their business going in Australia. And they had really gotten some bad advice, in, particular, in particularly around the Australian trusts that are very popular. Um, so we started working with them and help them sort through some very complex issues and get them in a good position from a US tax standpoint. After that, their advisors in Australia started referring other individuals who might be coming to the US or setting up business in the US. And the clients we worked with liked us, so they'd refer other people. They, they would know them before we knew it, probably half of our international tax practice is made up of Australian individuals. And we really enjoy working with Australians. Almost without question, they're some of the most pleasant people uh, from a cultural standpoint that we've had an opportunity to work with. Kevin, many viewers today are either on non-immigrant visas or are business owners with financial footprints in Australia and the US. Can you speak to some of the service that EFPR offers international clients? Well, we can pretty much do anything an international client needs from a tax standpoint. Uh, so we can help get an individual tax identif identification number. Uh, both Scott and Rich Mather, who are not here with us, are certifying agents. So we can make that process pretty seamless and, and painless. We can also help with some pre-immigration planning as people come to the U.S., especially if they have significant ties still to Australia in financial assets, businesses, or trusts. We think pre-immigration planning is, is one of the paramount things we can do because we have an opportunity to make a lot of choices that can put the individual immigrating from Australia into a very, very nice US tax position. But we need to do it as they're coming and before they file their first US tax return. Otherwise, opportunities can be lost. Kevin, we were speaking earlier about how you have many returning clients who have relatively straightforward tax returns. What value do you bring to Australians, say above a storefront tax preparer? Well, James, if it's all right, I'd like Scott to address that because he has some pretty good examples of some things he's been able to do that might help someone who goes to what you term a storefront tax preparer that may not have the breadth of knowledge that we have. Yeah, sure, Kevin. So. Uh, it all comes down to asking the right questions. So we're pretty well versed in what Australians are going to experience, what type of assets they have, what issues they're going to face when they come to the U.S. So we know what to ask. Uh, that's not always the case with the, the store from preparers. And I, I think we are sort of a one-stop shop when it comes from uh, a U.S. tax perspective. So not only can we help you apply for an ITIN, prepare U.S. tax returns and other informational filings. Uh, we also have the resources of larger firms. So uh, by that, we belong to uh, a membership of CPA America firms. Um, we have those resources as well as access to uh, Crow Global. So we have accountants basically um, that are located all throughout the world and have access to them as well. 
if I could ask the team a question, what are the typical mistakes you see that Australians make when preparing their US tax returns? I'll take that one. I think the, the biggest uh, issue or concern that we see is knowing now that you're, well, first of all, listening to all your facts and we ask probing questions to get answers. Um, realizing that you are taxed on your worldwide income and a lot of times you think your investments are over in Australia when in, in due fact, you've got to claim the income in any of those accounts on your US tax return. To add to that, the, the, the concept of worldwide taxation is, is a bit different. And the United States is one of few countries who operates like that. Often we find someone who may have been in the US for some time and they found out that, oh, I have a financial account that generates interest income in Australia. Oh, I am tied to a trust in Australia. I didn't know I had to report that income. Oh, I didn't know there's special forms to report some of that income from an FBAR to a form 8938 that discloses other financial assets to a form 3520 or 3520A for a foreign trust. So we've had a lot of clients that have come to us and have not filed properly. And we've been able to help them get caught up under what's called the streamlined filing program where IRS lets you go back and fix things uh, typically with little to no penalty, though there may be a nominal penalty in some cases. So, so that's something I think we, we see often when people haven't, haven't received the proper advice. Another quick example of things that we see is just missing elections that can be made. We are now working with a client based out of a big city in Ohio that immigrated to the U.S. that had significant ties to businesses and trusts in Australia. And they came to, to Ohio to set up their, their similar business in the US. And they had filed maybe three or four years of tax returns before we met them. And it was unfortunate that the firm they dealt with didn't have the knowledge to make proper elections that we could have made before they filed tax returns that would have given them a much, much better tax position in the US especially for the U.S. or the non-U.S. companies they had have in Australia. Um, so it was unfortunate. I think we made the best, the best possible scenario we could for them, but we were a bit uh, unable to go back and change things because they filed too many years worth of returns treating their Australian businesses one way where we have re would have rather had the opportunity to do it another way. There's a, there's a, item called a check the box selection that we can use to to do some good things for people who are immigrating that have business ties to Australia. And just if I can add uh, regarding the informational filing. So uh, the U.S. is uh, a lot of people view it as intrusive, but um, they like to figure out what non-U.S. financial accounts you have. And that brings us really to the FBAR filing. So typically, um, the FBAR, you have the FBAR filing when the aggregate account balances, so all your financial accounts that are located outside the U.S., when the highest balance uh, of all those accounts exceeds 10,000 U.S. dollars. So uh, it's pretty typical uh, of the super. Most people have a balance that already exceeds that just in the super alone. Uh, so when you exceed that threshold, you have that filing requirement. Uh, I think a lot of um, uh, empaths in general uh, don't know about the informational filings associated with their non-U.S. accounts because, you know, it's, it's unexpected. You wouldn't expect the IRS to be looking overseas at accounts that are, are not in the U.S. You wouldn't think they'd have any interest in that. Um, so we guide people through that preparation process and the filing process. We know what questions to ask, um, you know, and dig into their interests, uh, but essentially Anything, any financial interest, any financial account that you have has to be disclosed on this. Um, there are other uh, uh, accounts that need disclosure on other forms, but uh, this is the most applicable form, the most common filing that most people have when they come to the U.S. Um, if you uh, determine that you've missed an account in prior years, it's actually pretty simple. The IRS has uh, several programs available to taxpayers, um, one being the delinquent FBAR submission procedure. Um, and, and really, as long as you've reported any income that's being derived from those accounts, all you have to do is, is report 
uh, these accounts on the form and, and submit it and just explain why you're submitting late or why you're amending the form. It's actually pretty simple. Kevin, if I can ask you about repatriation and assisting expats with their final filings, um, the, it's a big topic at the moment. There's some people who are on green cards. They're considering relinquishing their green cards. Some people are married to US citizens. So we have this scenario where Australians are going back to Australia and still have tax commitments in the United States. Can you speak a little bit to that about how you've been assisting Australians with that situation? Sure, sure. There, as you know, James, there's a variety of situations an individual might find themselves in from a green card to a temporary visa. They may have significant assets still in the US or they may not have assets. They may be liquidating assets to leave. Uh, relinquishing a green card opens up its own uh, special issues that someone has to deal with and report. So we're pretty good and on top of helping assess what the individual needs to do as they leave. Do they need to file the forms that would demonstrate they're not subject to the section 877 cap A exit tax? We can help prepare those. We can help prepare final filings. If an individual goes back to Australia once they've wrapped up on on some of the items they need to be concerned about when they leave the U.S. If they still have financial ties to the U.S., we can continue to assist filing a non-resident tax return. If they're married to a U.S. citizen, we can help them know how to report their income in Australia for the U.S. citizen and what, what tax benefits like a foreign income exclusion they might be eligible for or foreign tax credits. So we run the gamut pretty much in helping clients understand what steps they need to take to leave. And we do that frequently. Yeah. So just to add on the hard act and um, what it essentially does is um, subjects certain individuals to an exit tax. And that exit tax uh, consists of a mark to market taxation of assets. And it's essentially a liquidation of any of your assets they treat it as if you had sold it uh, the day before you actually leave the U.S. And so the first thing we like to look at is what assets does the individual hold. Uh, we like to look at their prior tax filings, whether or not they're compliant or not, and whether or not the tax liability meets certain thresholds uh, and, and whether or not this tax actually applies to them. If the tax does apply, uh, we like to look at what is the actual tax hit and if, again, if the tax applies, is there anything that we can do from a planning perspective to avoid covered expatriate status? If I can add to that, Scott, um, I know of an instance where two Australians came over here some time ago and they had just bought, or they bought a property on the beach in Sydney for about $125,000. And at the time, that was a fair amount of money. They'd been in the United States nearly 20 years and that property had appreciated to over $2 million and they gave their green cards in just after the Hard Act came in. So that was in 2005. Mm. Not knowing of the implication, they ended up getting a tax bill for something like $800,000, which was the unrealized gain in that property that they had held in Australia. So they, in fact, had to sell the property in Australia to pay their US taxes, even though they hadn't sold it. So it is a mark to market on the unrealized gains in you. So as you say, it's important to sit down with someone like yourself who understands the right questions to ask and to make sure if there's any tax liability to understand all of that before you make a decision that you can't undo. Yeah, so in regards to that sale, the issue with the exit tax is that it may not actually be credible. Um, so what happens is the US would subject that uh, deemed liquidation to sale. So there's not an actual transaction taking place. And so uh, the home country may not, may not deem that uh, sale or disposition of asset as an actual event. And so no taxation is occurring. So you have a mismatch of taxable events. One could happen in one year and then um, say they decide to actually sell it in another year and then it would be subject to the home country tax. So that's, that's a big issue. Kevin, I know you touched on this earlier about a team approach. Can you expand a little bit more about how your organization works as a team, but also teaming with advisors and accountants in other tax jurisdictions? Our goal is to match up 
the client's needs with the best person internally to meet those needs. So if it's maybe a heavy inbound business transaction that an Australian company is setting up in the US and they need transfer pricing help, we can have someone from our team work on that. If it's more of an individual immigrating that might have a few ties to Australia still, and maybe they're going to be in the US on a temporary work assignment, um, Rochelle might lead on that or Scott might lead on that. Um, when there's other issues, we have three or four other individuals that we bring in to, to work with us. And sometimes when we have an issue that may be beyond our scope, we have the resources that Scott mentioned. We do have access to, to Crow International, both in the US and out of the US, to their Washington DC tax office, to their international tax people. So that's a great benefit that we can reach out to others. And we do that and we know when we need to do that. So that's a good thing. We also, I think, pride ourselves, James, in working with other advisors and, and taking a team approach there as well, whether it be immigration attorneys or financial advisors, financial advisors in the US, financial advisors in Australia, accountants in Australia. We always also want to involve Australian advisors when we're making decisions because we want to make sure we understand the impact of the planning or position in Australia as well. So we try to look at our work on a global basis, both Australia and the US, and then work appropriately with all the advisors. And we're not, we don't have a whole lot of pride. We're happy to get advice, learn something different, uh, put our heads together because you do a lot better job when you're working as a team. And, and again, I think we pretty much excel at doing that both internally and externally. I like to add what Kevin said is internally too. I'm most often there are two people that are familiar with your tech situation. If you, if we work with it. So if one of thinks of one topic, the other one catches it too. And then we're, we're talking about what's going on in Australia and what they're thinking too, and how things work out and what the side of Australia is saying versus the U.S. side. James, another important item that Australians in the U.S. should consider are wills and estate planning. And wills and estate planning really have two different issues to consider. From the estate tax standpoint that we have in the U.S., which is, again, a bit unique, there is no estate tax in Australia. There is no transfer tax on a gift in Australia, but we have that in the U.S. It's really important for someone coming from Australia to understand that and the implications they have, <clears throat> excuse me, as a, as a result of assets they may own in the U.S. Now, the exemptions from the estate and gift tax are fairly generous. So usually someone's not going to be exposed to that, but it's important to check. Also, to have a will in the U.S. is critical. Now, we don't draft wills, but we do work with attorneys who do. In the U.S., an attorney has to draft a will, but you're going to want to address things like what happens if you do die in the U.S.? Do you have children? Who would be the guardian for the children? Um, what about other issues that might come up if you're going to be in the U.S. for a long time? And even though you might not be subject to any estate tax on death, where, where do your assets go and how are they going to be treated? And the will is going to direct that. Do you want to use a U.S. trust to manage that? Do you have assets that might go in trust for children that a guardian might manage if both parents unfortunately died at the same time? So it's, it's often an overlooked topic for people coming into the U.S. to address legally, why do I need a will and what should it say? So we try to match someone up with attorneys that we work with or an attorney that they work with as well uh, to make sure that's taken care of. In 2017, the Australian community first published our book, uh, Moving to the U.S. for Aussies, which uh, covers a lot of topics for Australians who are coming to the United States. Kevin or Rochelle, perhaps uh, you could talk about some of the resources that you offer Australians so that they can prepare coming to the United States as well. Sure. Um, I have to mention from our website, there are a couple of ebooks that you're able to download for free. Um, for tax services for Australians living and working in the U.S. and what you may need to consider before coming to the U.S. So those are easy reads for you if you'd like to look those up. 
So if anyone is watching this video and they'd like to reach out to EFPR to understand more about your services, what would be the best way for them to do that? I think there's what, well, there's actually one or two ways to get a hold of us directly. Um, first is an, is an email by sending an email to itax at efprgroup.com or a direct phone call to area code 585-340-5186. And that is to Eric Hostetter, who is our marketing for our, our international team that will um, then forward the call to the right appropriate person on the team. Great. Well, we'll be sure to include all that information in the comments below. Kevin Hill, Rochelle Shan, and Scott Buckley, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's been a pleasure.